Uh, just a quick poll of the audience. How many of you consider yourselves to be developers? Excellent, good, good. How many of you are familiar with Dash? How many of you have worked with Dash? Okay, that helps. A little about me, I'm Jeff Tapper, uh, senior consultant with Digital Primates. Been building internet applications for about 20 years now. I started back in 1994. And for the past eight years, I've been focused largely on building video applications. So lots of experience. I've had a chance to write about a dozen books over the years on various internet technologies. And if you have any questions, that certainly ask questions throughout as you have them. Uh, they'll have, probably have some time for questions at the end also. If you have questions that are outside of what we're talking about here, but you just want to pick my brain, I'm around all day today and all day tomorrow. Come find me. Happy to talk. So today, the things that we're going to talk about are video and the internet today. We'll talk about the HTTP streaming options available to us. Uh, we'll talk about what can we do without a plugin these days. It's a big thing. We'll talk about Dash and Dash 264 and how we make it work in a browser. And I'm going to dive into one particular Dash implementation I've been working on uh, for the past year and a half or so, a JavaScript version of a Dash player. But the idea, most of what I'm talking about until we get to that specifics, is fairly generic and will apply to whatever technology you're using for Dash players. How many of you are web developers? Mobile developers? Set-top box developers? Okay. Other kinds of developers other than what I mentioned? Okay, that'll work. All right, so. As you guys probably know, if you're doing any sort of streaming video, we've got, as we've got video online, two primary options available to us. We can either do video as a progressive download, and the idea there, of course, is simply you have one video file sitting on a server, and it comes down over time and plays back as it's coming down to an end user. Some real benefits of progressive download is that it's going to work fairly ubiquitously. Now that H.264 is available in almost all of the browsers, progressive download's just going to work almost everywhere. The downside of progressive download, of course, are many. There's no real way to do adaptive bitrate. You can't effectively stop this at one version and switch up to a higher quality or lower quality. You're playing just this one file. So the other side of it, of course, are the streaming options. And within streaming, once again, there's a separation. We can either stream with the real-time the real time protocols. You guys are probably familiar with RTMP, RTSP, RTP. These are all the various real-time protocols. And the way these work is there is actually a connection, a socket from each individual connected client back to the server. And again, some real nice benefits in the real-time protocols are extremely low latency. Since we're just, we have a protocol that is dedicated specifically to pushing data from one server to one client, it works very quickly and very well. The downside of this, of course, is the required infrastructure if you're doing any sort of large scale. One of our clients is Major League Baseball, and you know, they routinely have hundreds of thousands of simultaneous connected viewers. It would require a tremendous infrastructure to have 100,000 or several hundred thousand open sockets to individual clients. So the preferred choice these days is HTTP streaming. And there's a number of different options in that world. Uh, HLS is far and away the most popular. That's Apple's HTTP live streaming format. How many of you are familiar with HLS? Uh, HDS is Adobe standard. That's HTTP dynamic streaming. Microsoft standard is smooth streaming. And so there's a lot of different options and proprietary standards out there. How many of you were in the keynote this morning? About half of you. Uh, the guy from Twitch TV was talking about how they've standard, standardized on HLS across their stack. So HLS is definitely a very popular choice these days. So part of the challenge that we have today is that while most folks are agreeing, agree for large scale streaming that HTTP is the right choice, we've got a lot of variation in what devices are going to support what formats. And there is no one standard that is supported ubiquitously. And this results in most companies that are trying to do this and trying to get this everywhere having several different versions of their content that they can stream to all the different platforms that they need, which is obviously a challenge. So 
as I mentioned earlier, progressive download is the only real option that is ubiquitously supported. Everyone supports progressive download. There are some variations in what codecs the different browsers are supporting. Right? Most of them at this point, I know Cisco earlier this year announced that they were going to pay for the licensing for all the browsers to use H.264, which was a huge, huge leap forward. Before that, we had lots of browsers that would only support WebM and VP8 and other options like that. And there's now new standards coming out of VP9, there's uh, H.265 and all sorts of other things of that sort. And there's just a wide variety of support. If you're just looking at desktop browsers, it's simple enough. As you start to look at across all the mobile devices, all across all the connected TVs, all the set-top boxes, it gets really vast very quickly. In terms of streaming to a browser, though, even once we get past all of the various other issues, the only browser that natively will support streaming is going to be Safari on iOS and macOS. There are now options for us to do streaming directly to a browser using media source extensions. Any of you familiar with media source extensions? Very few of you. Media source extensions are an extension to the W3C specification for internet protocols. And what it really allows us to do, you guys are familiar with the video tag in HTML5? Media source, which, and the way the video tag works out of the box is you simply give it a URL of a file on iOS and Safari uh, for macOS, you can give it the URL of a manifest of the M3U8, and it will play back that one file. And again, that's how we do progressive download into the browsers these days. What media source extensions do is they give us an API to that video tag to allow us to hand a little bit of video data at a time to it. So effectively, we can write a whole application around that that allows us to do streaming on the fly. The same way that you would implement HTTP streaming in any other platform, you figure out where the segments are, where the, where the data lives, you download the bits and you hand it over to the browser. And you're able then programmatically to start controlling, you know, is this the right bit rate? Should I switch up? Should I switch down? And it gives us all this control that we otherwise lack in HTML5 video. The media source extensions currently are only available in Chrome and Internet Explorer 11. However, if you follow the public forums at all from Mozilla, you can see that they're actively working on implementing their support for media source extensions. Opera has made public comments about planning support for media source extensions. So while right now it's just the two browsers that cover about half of the users in the world, it's coming to more. And so that'll be very encouraging. And so as I say, media source extensions, they allow for just bits of the data to come in at a time and to be handed over and allows us to do real streaming. Um, it's currently a candidate recommendation to the HTML working group and I think that last update was a few months ago. I actually haven't checked this week to see if it's moved to the next stage towards approval. But the hope is that it will get to the full approval within a year. MPEG Dash, most of you said you were familiar with MPEG Dash. It's Dash's dynamic adaptive streaming over HTTP. The real key differentiator of Dash, as opposed to any of the other HTTP streaming formats, is it's an open standard. HLS, HDS, Smooth Streaming, they're all owned by one company. And some of them have become de facto standards on their own, but the more I work with broadcasters and people who are used to open standards like AM and FM and UHF and VHF, these are standards that everybody agrees on. The broadcasting world loves standards. It makes sense. They don't have to jump around and say, well, I'm going to switch vendors again, so I've got to retool everything I've ever done. That's the nice thing about the Dash world, is it's an open standard. There's some other nice things about Dash in that it was designed by Adobe and Microsoft and Apple, among other companies, folks who had already written standards similar to these before, but it was designed several years later where they've learned lessons. They've figured out, oh, you know what? We don't handle this so well. Next time, we should try something more like this. And so Dash was designed with a lot of these best practices in mind of the idea of more easily handling multiple audio streams. While HLS and HDS and smooth streaming can be forced to work with demuxed audio and video, for the most part, they like to work with the audio and video together in the same file. And while certainly you can imagine in most, most of the time, it makes sense to have them in the same file. 
but when you're switching between several different audio tracks, right? If we have a baseball game that is being broadcast in four different languages, the same video feed, four different audio feeds. As we're duplicating the content, why do we want to duplicate the video which isn't going to change across those four? Why not just have one video feed and then four different audio feeds and you can choose which one makes the most sense? Right? Demuxing audio and video makes a lot of sense. And Dash was designed with that in mind from the beginning. Smooth streaming and HLS can now handle demuxed audio and video. They don't do it all that elegantly because it was an afterthought. It was added on. Another interesting thing about Dash, again, most of the other standards I've talked about were built with H.264 in mind. It was the de facto standard at the time, and so they're built around that. Dash was built to be codec agnostic. Dash doesn't care what the content is. Really all Dash is is a way of segmenting your MP4 files and describing where to find those segments. So those MP4 files, whether you've encoded them with H.264, H.265, VP6, VP8, VP9, it doesn't matter. Dash doesn't care. In fact, Dash has the ability in a single manifest to describe that same content with several different encodings. And the player can then figure out, oh, I know how to play this one. I'm going to grab that part, and that's how I'm going to handle it. So as I say, it's designed with a lot of the best practices, a lot of the lessons learned from the other streams already designed. So at Digital Primates, we've been working with video players for many years, and we've built several different Dash players over the years. We started in Flash. We used to do a lot of Flash work. How many of you have Flash developers? A whole lot less than in years past when I've asked similar questions. It's the uh, nature of the world, I suppose. Uh, we're doing a lot less Flash ourselves these days. We still do some, but not as much as we used to. But we've built out Dash players for Flash, for Android, and for HTML, as well as some for the set-top boxes as well. And we've built Dash.js. It's an open source project with the BSD3 license. It's available on GitHub. Anyone that wants to grab it and start playing with it, by all means do. Anyone that wants to start contributing, please do. We've got several active contributors, and we're actively seeking more. But Dash.js was initially built as the reference player for the Dash Industry Forum. And the Dash Industry Forum is where a lot of the major players who are working with Dash today, it's a place where they get together and they can discuss ideas and figure out how to promote interoperability. And one of the things when I started getting involved, I found that while there was all sorts of discussions between encoders and DRM and CDNs and all sorts of other places, there weren't a lot of folks who were interested in players. And players, of course, are where I'm most interested. So I got involved, and we architected the initial version of Dash.js as the reference player for the Dash Industry Forum. So the way we play a Dash stream, and this is going to be the same regardless of what technology you're using, is you're going to start with a manifest file. Let me just give you a quick example here. So that's not the manifest file, sorry. Here's a manifest file. Oh, it's way too small. And what this does is it just describes the content and which we can use to figure out what are the segments? Where do we find the content we want to play? And I'll go into more detail on manifest files for you in a few minutes, but the whole idea of the manifest, it's an XML file that describes what bit rates are available to us and where to find the content. You'll notice right off the bat that we have a separate separation between our video and our audio. So down here, in this case, we have a single audio representation. Right? As we're switching bit rates, we're, it's the video that we have different qualities of. We've got one audio quality that's going to be used the same across all of these. For some of our clients that are more concerned on the audio side, we might have exactly the opposite. We might have a single video and several audio. In fact, the, this particular Dash.js player was the basis for, any, are you guys familiar with what the BBC recently did? They did a week long, or sorry, two weeks long broadcast, audio only broadcasts using Dash.js. Uh, I think that was late March, early April. It was, uh, and so in their case, they had no video representations at all. It was all purely audio representations. So to get started, we simply, we download the manifest we parse the manifest, right? It's XML, we gotta figure out what's there. We 
all along the while, anytime we're downloading a file, we're trying to make decisions, what's the proper bit rate for this client? And these are complicated decisions. There's a lot of different things that can go into it. And especially as you're first starting, you don't have a lot of information yet. But what we do know is that you've downloaded a file. We know how big that file is and we know how long it took to download that file. So we can start to make a first guess about what your bandwidth might be. So we try to make a guess at our initial bandwidth for the client. We'll then initialize the player, hand over the initialization segments to the player so that it knows how to play that bit rate. And that initialization will happen every time you switch bit rates, mostly because you can have different profiles of your codec for the different bit rates. And that's part of how you're going to achieve your different bit rates and your different optimizations. And then we're gonna start downloading segments. And as the segments get downloaded, we're gonna hand them over to the player. Yes? So the question is, for having audio and video demuxed, having them separated, do you need, you need to initially do two different initializations. You won't reinitialize for every segment. You'll reinitialize only when you're making a change of bit rate. But I mean, you still have to download the segment. You, each segment gets downloaded separately, yes. Audio, audio and video. Yes, that's absolutely correct. So a question about imp is there increased latency on mobile applications if you are demuxing these? And the reality is, yes, there is some additional latency. And again, as you talk about the latency, certainly downloading two files is, has more inherent latency because there's all of the opening and closing of sockets and all the things that happen with each download, although the keep alive tends to keep those open, which mitigates most of those, those factors for you. And the other mitigating factor, of course, is that the files tend to be smaller. The audio files are relatively, you know, unless you're handling, you know, 51 channel surround sound, which we've seen, it's, they tend to be relatively small. Um, so we download the segments, we hand the segments over to the player. In the case of the one I'll, I'll show you, it's the media source extensions is how we're handing it to the player, but same idea, there's an API in Android for how we hand data over to there. There's an API for the, for Flash and API for the connected TVs and so on and so forth. And each time that we're downloading these files and as we're playing back these files, we're collecting a series of metrics. And we're gonna use these metrics to start to make decisions about is this the proper bit rate for this end user? And then there's all sorts of other efficiencies we can start to throw in there if we're already at the top bit rate. If we know there's no higher bit rate to go to and we have extra, bit, extra bandwidth available to us, we can actually start to increase our buffer. We can start to download more content. So there's less chance that they're gonna to have to switch down lower if, they, if something happens, there's a hiccup in their connection. We try to get as much content at that highest bit rate while we can. But again, there's all sorts of logic that can go into this. So Dash, as we're dealing with it, fundamentally there's gonna be three different types of files that you'll deal with. There's the manifest, that's the XML file I showed you. There's the initialization file, which is actually just it's a segmented MP4. It's part of the MP4 box structure that is gonna be used to tell the player, here's what the content you're gonna start playing is. And the internal of the player, that varies differently between Android and Flash and HTML, but fundamentally they need to know what kind of content they're gonna play so they can play it effectively. And then there's the individual segment files. This is the actual content. And again, when you're demux, there's a separation between the audio and the video they don't have to be demuxed, they can be muxed together, in which case they're all in one file. And your segments will contain zero to many video tracks, zero to many audio tracks. So our manifest, as we start to look at it, there's a couple different ways that we'll dig through and see how these manifests work, but fundamentally, like any XML document, there's a root node, and then inside the root node, you're gonna have a series of child tags. Fundamentally, our initial set of child tags are the periods and each period describes a discrete segment, a discrete section, I don't wanna use the word segment, it's, it means too many different things already, a discrete section of the video content. The primary use case I've found for periods has been advertising. And that you can describe, I'm gonna play the content for 15 minutes and then I'm gonna switch over to a two minute ad break, then I'm gonna play the content for 14 more minutes, then I'm gonna switch over to a three minute ad break. Each of those sections is a period. 
And so as, and each period can have a duration assigned to it. And so we can switch between these periods as we need to switch over to advertising. Or there's other potential use cases as well. Advertising is the most common one of those. Each period contains adaptation sets for the video and audio. And the idea of an adaptation set is it's functionally equivalent content at different bit rates. And so an example, what do I mean by functionally equivalent? If you can imagine a, any piece of content you're playing back, you might have HD and SD versions, right? Versions that are in a four by three format and version in a 16 by nine format. And as you're switching bit rates, you really don't want your player bouncing back and forth between four by three and 16 by nine, right? You really wanna stay within one or the other. To switch between the two would not be functionally equivalent. So you might have an adaptation set that describes the four by three content and a separate adaptation set that describes the 16 by nine content. And anytime logic needs to happen to switch bit rates, it knows to only switch within the same adaptation set. For some of our audio clients, they get really picky about switching between stereo and multi-channel surround. It can be very jarring to have seven channels surround and suddenly five of the seven channels drop out and you're just stuck back to left and right. And so in their content, they describe their audio segments in different adaptation sets. Here's our seven channel surround content. Here's our five channel surround content. Here's our stereo content. Here's our mono content. And again, what that tells us as developers is that when we're switching, only switch between the same adaptation set, between the same functionally equivalent content. Does that make sense? All right, so as we go to describe the representations, and this is where things can get a little bit complicated. Yes? Ultimately, that's gonna be a business rule. So it may be based on, you know, if you're playing on a device that is more square and less uh, elongated rectangular, you are gonna switch for certain things. I've got my clients generally tell me what they wanna do with the content for different styles of devices. And sometimes they give the client, the end user, a, a choice. Do you wanna watch in widescreen or do you wanna watch in this mode or whatever else? So that business logic is built into the client side They're built into the individual client side players. Some of it we're able to do detection, we're able to figure out do they have a surround sound decoder and things of that sort. Usually not. Um, it could, you could write the player logic in such a way that it tries to favor the top one and if it can't play that, it goes, fails to the next one and to the next one. But for the most part, we, we tend to just have our clients tell us, on these devices, we want you to use that content, on that device, this other content. So there's a question about, is it practical to have different manifests which have effectively just different profiles, different sets of adaptation sets that are only available to those particular users? And in a lot of cases, we'll do exactly that, uh, especially if there is a separation between premium content and non-premium content. Some of our clients have subscribers that are only allowed to get the SD content and not the HD content. So we don't wanna send to the end user the manifest that will even describe what HD content might be available. There's other things that we won't know until it starts playing back, like what's the audio that it's connected to? Is it mono, stereo, five channel, seven channel, or something else? <laughs> so it's, in some cases, it's entirely practical, in other cases, less so. There was a question? Yes, and just a comment on the point of selecting the adaptation sets. If the player knows nothing, there's semantics within the manifest to describe which is the primary video and audio adaptation set. So a player that knows nothing else can go and look for that attribute and know these are the main ones I've mentioned. Absolutely, as Will points out, not, it's not the order of the adaptation sets, there's actually nodes, there's actually attributes of the node that say this is the primary one. If all else fails, this is the one I want you to play. So other questions on this point? All right, so as we go to describe the representations, again, we've got several different choices. And for better or worse, one of the, um, 
pain points or great designs of Dash, depending on how you look at it, is there's a lot of different choices available to people creating the content, to people segmenting the content. We have three different ways of describing the various representations available to us. It can be done with a segment base, which effectively is going to assume that for each bitrate, there is a single file sitting on the server, and the server is going to chop it up as it's requested and hand you individual byte range requests. So you'll say, I need bytes one through 2001, and it will, the server will know how to hand that off to you. And that becomes the simplest from the describing the content point of view. It requires additional logic at the server to be able to know how to handle byte range requests. It's not terribly complex logic, but it does not require any sort of pre-segmentation. The other choices are either using a segment list or a segment template. A segment list simply will describe for you, here is the list of segments and here's how you play them. The segment template will use wild cards to start to insert that. And the main differences between the segment base where you're doing the segmentation on the fly and the other ones where it's pre-segmented, it's really, it's a trade-off between processing power and storage. Some companies, based on their infrastructure, will decide that it is cheaper to just store the file once and chop it up on the fly and have more processing power. Other companies would rather save their processing power and have more storage. And I've seen valid use cases for both. It took me a while to understand why, given how cheap storage was, people would want to do it on the fly instead, but I understand now. So a segment list looks like this, where there is literally within the representation, we describe here's a segment list that each segment's gonna have a duration of, is that 10,000? So 10,000 milliseconds, so it's 10 second segments. And that 1,000 milliseconds equals one second. So we then specify, here's the URL for the initialization, and then here's each of the individual segments that you're going to play. Very simple, literally it's a list. We treat them as an array and we just go next to next to next. The reason we wanna know things like the duration and the time scale is for when the user seeks. I need to know if they seek to 15 minutes in, which one to get. And so these attributes, time, scale, and duration, give me that additional information that I might need in order to pull that off. A segment template with a fixed duration, my favorite use case because it's simple. And what it will effectively tell us is that with each of these, within the representation, there's a template, so all of the segments will be the same length, and so you'll see here we have a duration of each segment, where's my cursor here? A duration for each segment and a time scale. So we know in this case, each segment is 13.8 seconds long. And we're able to very quickly, just with wild cards, increment a number. So first I'm gonna play one, then I'm gonna play two, then I'm gonna play three. If I wanna seek ahead, I can very quickly do the math and figure out what number the next segment is. These are great because they're easy, but oftentimes in the real world, it doesn't quite work that well. Oftentimes the segments aren't all exactly the same length. And so the other choice we have here then becomes a segment template with variable duration. And we do that with a segment timeline. And we're able to say, here's our template, here's gonna be what your pattern is gonna be, right? We're gonna substitute in the bandwidth, we'll substitute in a time variable. And then we're able to specify for each segments that we're gonna have, the first segment is going to be a particular duration. And then for others, we can use a R node to tell, we're gonna repeat at this particular duration over and over for so many times. In this case, we're gonna repeat twice. Oftentimes, it's gonna be, I'm gonna repeat at this duration. You might just have two, two of these attributes. I'm gonna start, and my first 150 segments are this duration. The last segment is a different duration because it didn't break up evenly. There was, the math came out slightly differently. Does that make sense? And these are all just different ways of describing how, the content, how we find the content. So ultimately, the idea of the manifest is to tell us what's available and where to find it. So the Dash.js players I mentioned, it's an open source BSD3 project using media source extensions, using encrypted media extensions. Didn't, anyone familiar with encrypted media extensions? Encrypted media extensions are the way that we can do DRM in HTML today. It's available by the same browsers currently as the media source extensions. That would be Chrome and IE 11. I know, Fire, I know uh, Mozilla is working on it. I haven't heard from Opera specifically on EME. Do you know if there? No word from Opera on EME yet. 
But so our Dash player that we'll dive into here, it's written in JavaScript and it works in Chrome and IE 11 currently. So, uh, so some recent uses of our Dash.js player, I mentioned the BBC live broadcast that happened late March. Uh, Wowza, anyone familiar with Wowza's media servers? For, they send a test player with their server for their Dash content, that is Dash.js, it's literally just out of the box. I don't think they customized it in the least bit. It's our player exactly as it is. Uh, Easy DRM, anyone familiar with these guys? They provide D DRM hosting services. And again, their test player that they use is the Dash.js player and lots of other folks. The interesting part of an open source project is we don't know who's using it. It's free for anyone to grab and start using. And most of the ones that I've found that I know that they're using, I've just done Google searches on strings that I know are in those JavaScript files to figure out who has those on their server. And that's the best clue I have of knowing who has the content, who's using the player. Oh, sorry, let me just give you guys, quickly show you the player running here. So I'm just gonna grab this particular manifest file I was showing you earlier, copy it, we'll paste it into our player. Let's turn the zoom back off. And we'll load the content up, give it a second to initialize. And so what this is here, downloaded and played back here in real time. So again, this is and again, this is more of a lab quality version of the player right now, so you've got lots of debug tools. You can manually switch the bit rates if you want or let it automatically choose it for you. You can find additional information as you're playing back about the buffer or other debug elements and we can just dig into all sorts of pieces within here about how much content's in the buffer and so on and so forth. Again, for a production player, you wouldn't want all of this, but for a lab quality player to test interoperability, it makes a lot of sense to have all of this. So let's take a look at how this is all built. Absolutely true. So live streaming is a particular challenge. In, in Anyone who does any video streaming knows that VOD and live, while they look the same to the end user, they're very different use cases and there's a lot of different considerations in terms of how to handle live. And there's still, even within the Dash industry forum, a lot of discussion going on about the proper way of describing and handling live streams. As I mentioned, Dash allows for lots of different ways of describing elements. And ultimately on live, the biggest challenge is calculating the live edge. What is the most recent segment that I know exists? And there's all sorts of challenges around that. If you're, like the BBC, customizing a player for one particular set of encoding that they, they control on their own, it becomes much easier. There's no variability. They don't have to handle all 15 possible ways that that live edge could be calculated or necessarily the difference in how time codes are known by different devices. But given that each device may or may not have the same concept of what now means. My laptop and this laptop over here could be off by a couple, you know, a couple seconds, a couple minutes. There's no requirement in the real world that every device knows exactly the same time. And so that makes challenges and depending on the nature of the difference, if the server is faster, if the server is ahead of the clients, there's very few problems because the content already exists. But if you've got a client that is even 10 seconds ahead of the server, ahead of the encoder, then suddenly you've got a client looking for content that hasn't been created yet because its concept of now is different. And so there's lots of challenges there. The latest version, version 112, is that our latest version, Will? 1.1. 1 .1. 1 .1. Okay. Uh, version 1.1 1 .1 of the Dash player, Dash JS player actually has much better live support. Previous versions, live support was weaker, and it continues to get better. What's that? 
it, well, it wasn't fully disabled, it just, it only worked in very explicit use cases. So I know uh, 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 a company out in San Diego had been doing a bunch of live streaming with Dash.js specifically, and it worked, it was, it specifically worked in their case because they met the exact criteria that version 1.0 of the player was built around. Well, ultimately, the client, if the client wants to be at the live edge, you're watching a football game, you want to see the same thing you would see or as close as possible as the same thing that you would see to the TV. The client needs to know what segment to ask for. Well, so, so there, part of the differences between HLS and Dash is that HLS has a requirement that you're going to re-download the manifest frequently. Dash does not have that requirement. In fact, there's a, an attribute inside the manifest that tells you how often you should update the manifest. There are folks who are doing live streaming and have that attribute set to never upload, no, never update the manifest. They require the client to figure out what now means. So Using the segment template, exactly. So there's a, there's a lot of variation, a lot of different ways these things can be handled. And that's part of the challenge that we're dealing with on it. So the Dash.js player, in order to actually make use of it, there's three core JavaScript libraries that are required. Uh, we do a lot of asynchronous handling, so we use Q as a framework for that. We do dependency injection to make it more flexible, more customizable, and we're using Dijon as our dependency injection framework. Any of you are familiar with dependency injection? Handful of you, okay. Um, actually, the unit tests are all done in Jasmine. That's not actually required by the core player, but for testing as you're working with it, it is required. The website around the Dash.js player uses several other libraries as well. You don't need to use these libraries in order to use Dash.js, but if you go and look at the, view the source of our player, you'll see all these other libraries included purely for the convenience of building that web page. So the core things in order to use Dash.js are just Q for asynchronous handling and Dijon for the dependency injection. So the Dash.js player, structurally, there's the classes are divided into two separate packages. And just a little bit of background, even though this was built initially as the reference player for the Dash industry forum, I, from the beginning, expected that we would want to be able to make use of this for other streaming technologies at some point in the future. I didn't want to hard code this to only ever work for Dash. The reality is media source extensions don't really care how the content is segmented, how the content is described. They just care that it gets back content that it knows how to play. So we divided our code into the two packages, the core streaming package, which has any of the baseline elements that are gonna be common regardless of what the format of the content is, and then our Dash specific package, which has any of the subclasses of those specific to playing Dash. So within our streaming package, we have things like Media Player JS. This is the core thing that you're going to instantiate to make use of the player. And the idea is you'll instantiate it, you'll hand it a reference to the HTML element, the video element, and the URL that you're going to play. So this is the one that the end user, the developer, will interact with primarily. If they just want to take Dash.js and start using it today, this is the, the piece they care most about. The context JS, I mentioned dependency injection. The contexts are how we specify what classes to include, what dependencies do we want for our player. And if we take a quick peek at what some of these, our core context, we'll simply map particular classes to particular class names. So when we say we want a buffer controller, by default, it's going to use this particular buffer controller. But the interesting thing about this is this allows us to let people in the real world wholesale replace our classes and drop their own, their own in. So one of the places we see this most frequently is in our adaptive bitrate logic. Adaptive bitrate, have any of you written your own adaptive bitrate logic before? No, it's very complex and is very specific to individual use cases. 
sometimes if you're doing live sporting events, the primary goal for them is ultra low latency. We want to get the user as close as possible to the live edge, and we're willing to suffer in quality to get them there closer. Others, I've done some art installations where we're streaming, and what's the most important to them is that everybody sees it at the highest possible quality they can withstand. So even if it takes longer to start up to get, build more of a buffer, they don't care. They'd rather you wait an extra 10 seconds to see the content, but when you see it, you see it as it was intended. And there's millions of options in between. And so our adaptive bitrate logic can be wholesale ripped out and replaced by somebody else's based on their use cases. Does that make sense? So Stream.js, one of the core classes, it, it's ultimately responsible for loading the manifest and refreshing the manifest if that becomes required. It creates the actual buffers and will create the buffer manager that will manage those buffers. And it's the one that's actually listening to the video element for events coming back. So it can tell us things, we get various, you know, we're at the end of the content. The users clicked play, the users clicked pause, the various events that come to us from the video element itself are heard through Stream.js. In live broadcasts, Stream.js is told, is the one that specifically has to figure out what does live mean. Debug.js, it's a convenient class that gives us additional debugging logic. Buffer controller, core class that's responsible for getting the, seg getting the segments, getting the content, and handing them over to the buffer. Inside there, the buffer controller knows how to check with the adaptive bitrate rules and all of the logic that goes with it. There's logic within the manifest that tells us how much time, what's the minimum amount of time that should be in the buffer. The buffer controller knows about that and is able to manage that and watch that for us. Our manifest loader and our fragment loader, responsible for, as you can guess from their names, the manifest and the individual segments. Our ABR controller, again, this is the one that's most often replaced, at least in my experience. This is the one that knows how to figure out what bit rates, what bit rates should be played. And so this knows, has a, within it a series of rules, an array of rules that it's able to run through and based on those rules come out with an outcome. We should switch up to X, we should switch down to Y, or we should keep playing the same quality. And then some of those specific rules, uh, we'll look at two of them. Uh, the easiest one to understand, the download ratio rule. How big is the file? How long did it take to download? It's a real rough metric. It's not the only thing you ever want to base it on, but it gives you an initial baseline. How long, you know, what's my estimated bandwidth based on that? Insufficient buffer rule, another really core rule. If you find that it's taking longer to download each segment than that segment takes to play back, you've got a problem. You're going to run dry in your buffer. And so this rule can suggest to us we switch qualities based on what's happening within the buffer. Within the dash package, yeah. So um, how do you mean about a, what, can you give me more details about what specifically, but the discontinuity? Sure. So uh, the question is, as we're switching bit rates, does the browser need to be notified? And ultimately, yes. The, as you're switching bit rates, the browser, the HTML video element needs to be reinitialized. We need to hand it the initialization segments for that new bit rate before we start playing back the content. And so before the switch happens, we'll download that as well, and we'll hand that off so it knows how to handle that switch afterwards. We have another context class which is specific to anything Dash, which tells us how exactly are we going to parse the dash manifest? How exactly, our index handler, how are we gonna know which dash files to get? Uh, and then any specific extensions, lots of different companies have done things slightly differently within their manifest, so we've got some manifest extensions for individual clients. Our dash parser, as you can imagine, responsible for parsing that dash file. One of the things that we do inside here, given that the manifest is XML, but within the JavaScript world, JSON is far more efficient, we switch it all over to JSON and we're able to work much quicker. 
our initial versions where we weren't doing this JSON switch were a lot slower in our manipulation and our parsing of the manifest. And the dash parser knows how to handle the various inheritance. Within the dash manifest, lots of different attributes can be set at different levels in the hierarchy. So this knows how to figure out, well, if you set the base URL at the top level node, how does that echo down through the others or other things of that sort? Our dash handler is ultimately responsible for figuring out which fragment you want next. And in terms of the API, the way you're gonna work with this, the two core methods that get called most frequently is get segment request for time. And this is what you're gonna use if you're going to seek, right? I'm gonna go into 15 minutes in and I'm playing at quality, you know, three within the array. So it's gonna say, tell me what the right file to ask for is for that quality at that time. The other one that's called most often is get next segment. Simply within, you know, for whatever quality I give you, I want you to give me the next available segment of it. How am I doing on time? I, am I just about out of time? Do I need to, anyone? Right around there, okay, so anyways. The fundamental flow of how you work with this to start using the Dash player in the real world, you'll create a context and media player instance. Looks like this. Initialize the media player, give it the manifest URL, attach the video element. And either call play or if autoplay is not set to, tr is set to true, it'll play automatically. And then all these other things happen in the background. The slides will be available uh, through the, con the conference website so you can get the more details of all the things that happen in the background. But really, it's these three here are as a developer to use this, all you really need to know. And if you want more information on any of this, uh, there's another Dash session, A104, today at 2.45. Uh, the Dash Industry Forum website is here and our reference player is there. The source code for the reference player is here within GitHub. And if you want to understand more about the HTML extensions, the media source extensions and encrypted media extensions, their URLs are here. And my Twitter info if you want to reach out on Twitter. <laughs>